Warren Cycling Podcast. My name is Dean Warren. I'm in Munich, Germany today. And I'm Randy Warren, and I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. I wonder yeah. where you are. I, I didn't ask you in the pre yeah. podcast talk just to wait and see. So. Sure. Well, I put a picture behind me of a picture of the weather, the situation here in Munich as far as being right in the dead of winter. It was 24 degrees Fahrenheit out last I checked, which is like minus six Celsius. Um, it's already dark. It got dark by five o'clock, I think, already. But I guess that's um, not necessarily, I mean, it's a winter time thing, not much daylight. But I went to look for the bike that I've had outside here for like at least four and a half years. It's gone. Oh, not no. there anymore. Yeah. And it's it's been locked to a rack, right? Right. But the lock wasn't very secure. And it wasn't holding good air in the rear tire. I would pump it up and I could get a ride in, but it would start to get a little soft by the end of the ride. So, yeah, so I've, I've been actually losing qu- bikes over the last year, it seems. I mean, well, Taylor sold one of mine in San Diego when, it, when he moved to San Diego. And and then I lost. Oh, I went to check on. Did you say it was OK to sell or? It had some of its parts on it. It wasn't necessarily a, hey, it's okay, I'm going to sell this bike, but no, I sold the bike. <laughs> so, um, and like, did, he give you, did he give you the money then? <laughs> selling the bike? <laughs> no, we won't talk about that. Um, <laughs> I went to look, which I was pretty sure it wasn't there anymore, a bike I'd left in a hotel in Tel Aviv. Um, and they couldn't find it there, but I just wanted to confirm. I didn't, I didn't think it would be there, so... So uh, there's been a tradition of bikes. Taylor's going to check on, and his grandma's a bike I had once that may be still there. I don't know. He he would like to use it for an indoor trainer because he can't use his trainer now because he doesn't have a, a bike with a quick release on the front. Yeah. On the front? And then on the rear front? front? Uh, yeah, on the front. For the, for the, it's got the little roller in the back. Oh. The little mini roller. And you put the fork on the front. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh. There's one more bike, though. I, I could have a big attrition. There's one more bike I'm going to check on hopefully later this summer when we start flying back to Zurich again in Zurich in a hotel. So I guess it's a new year. I'm thinking about, you know, when you want to clean out and clean up stuff. So it's not exactly how I, I like to have that go by getting rid of bikes, but but yeah. maybe uh, less less is is better, huh? So uh, in some ways, yeah, I don't yeah. know. I- we we our basement just got semi flooded yesterday from the torrential rain. This system was huge. It was from Florida all the way up to Minnesota. You know, it was it was a gigantic system. And I checked before I left the house yesterday, just for a couple hours, and the the basement was completely dry. I came back two hours later, three hours later, <laughs> water every place. Oof. So yeah, how, so, like how deep? I not mean, very is it measurable. Just, like just, just a, no, just a, on the floor, enough to get boxes wet and stuff. But I in most. When we first moved in here, we have some flooding, so I put everything up on shelves, which was a huge project. And then, uh, yeah, over the years, you know, of course, you just accumulate more stuff, and we've only had flooding a couple more times. I didn't, have, didn't. have you shifted more to, like, plastic container boxes, or are you talking well, cardboard still? And some? Still cardboard, because most of the times now the boxes on the floor are ones that I just got, and I didn't put down someplace, and I didn't have a place to put them, so I just put them on the floor in the basement, and so... Yeah. So anyway, so that's attrition too. So I'll get rid of some of that stuff too. But that, now I have to go through all that kind of stuff though too to see what got ruined and what didn't get ruined and and all that kind of stuff too. So yeah, it happens. It happens sometimes. Yeah. Like I guess it it's pay sometimes not to have much stuff. Right. Well, one way or another, it'll be gone. Yeah. So it's the tenth uh, of January, twenty twenty four. It's our second podcast of the of the new year. It's episode three forty three. If I'm keeping track well. Um, I guess a lot of podcasts, they do seasons, but we're just doing a continuous <laughs> since the start in uh, 2016. So we're in our, is this eight years we'll have in 2016, but it's really like our ninth year, if you count every year. Is that how you do it? If it's 2016 well, a year and then. Sometimes they have seasons, that'll, multiple seasons in one year. So you yeah. could, so if you do seasons wise, so it's probably like a TV show or something. So, right. Well, we're at. 343 so actually i'm counting up to get to 365 or be 366 this year as a leap year so if you wanted to you could listen to a different podcast every day of the year from the warren cycling yeah. podcast yeah that'd be good that'd be good i just looked at my on the warren cycling facebook page i only have up to 341 i must have missed 342 the last one yeah yeah i'm sorry with that unless i skipped a number so 
Uh, no, I don't think so, because this, this, that one we were together, 341, we were together. All right, right, right. our Christmas uh, podcast on December. So we're looking at the uh, uh, cyclocross season still continuing pretty much the way it's been going, with Matteo Vanderpool dominating um, the first World Tour road races coming up in Australia. And they, they when we talked last week, they had done the time trial um, championship in Australia. Now they've done the road race. Which the pretty much same result for for the men's well, side. Yeah. I mean, in because a, in a way, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, so Team Jake Olulu by far is the biggest presence there, and so Luke Papp and Chris Harper, Flap and Chris Harper, um, broke away early, I guess. Like, 50, yeah, they 60. went by over six minutes. Yeah. So they well, they there were was only eighteen finishers too. Yeah, and there was a lot more people that raced it because the one one result sheet I looked at only had like twenty some people on it. But if you look at the the full results, oh, big a DNF lot. list, yeah. yeah, like there's a ton of DNFs. Kind of like a USA Cycling Road Championship. The attrition yeah. is usually maybe more like thirty some finishers in the USA. Traditionally, the well, last few years it's, since it's not, been in Knoxville and, and Chattanooga, yeah. even but um, this year it should be different because it's going to be a they say a flatter course, even though it's in Charleston, West Virginia, which is a very mountainous area. It, on both sides of the river, there's huge mountains. So, but maybe it's going to run up and down the river. But it should be a lot bigger group together if it's going to be a Paris type course, is what I heard Jim Miller say. Um, so then, yeah, much flatter. So probably much bigger. But you're right. Yeah, normally the attrition is is super high in that course, and it was in this in this one as well too. And Caleb Ewan, who said it was his dream to win the road race, but he's also on Jake Olulu. And so, but he won the crit, the national championship crit the day before, but that's not a UCI, um, well, it's not a world championship qualifying race. So he, even though he has that jersey, he won't be able to wear it in any uh, UCI race. He'll have to wear it just in, just to be races in Australia anymore. Does uh, Europe, Europe even have any UCI criterium races? I don't know. We, we, I, we actually have had, Criterion races, UCI criterion races here in the United States. We talked last week about somebody who was in Elk Grove, and uh, that was a UCI race, and it was all crits. <laughs> so they called it one or two a road race because it was long enough to qualify, but basically it was all crits. So um, yeah, I don't know if there's. I mean, we saw a crit back in 1988, the summer of '88 in in uh, Freiburg, Germany. We watched a crit, a pro crit there. Um, probably was not UCI. Of course, probably it wasn't. Not. UCI. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't. I, and then and the UCI does run some crits too because they run the ones in Japan. And so it's pretty highly unlikely you're going to see Caleb Ewing wearing a world championship um, jersey in a UCI crit race this year, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because actually, if he goes to Japan to do those posts, the, you know, the ones that the, that the tour front or ASO, I guess, runs those, ASO runs those, not UCI. And because they wear the jerseys from whatever they want, that's arbitrary jerseys. They wear yellow jerseys or red jerseys or both. You know, like, look at that. Yeah, anything you know they can have there or national team jerseys or whatever the promoter wants them to race because they're just trying to promote cycling in general. And so Caleb, if he raced those, if he didn't have another jersey to wear, he could wear the national jersey there. I'm sure. Uh, so yeah, you're right though. It's unlikely to see uh, see him wearing that jersey. But anyway, yeah. So but he didn't finish. He, he didn't finish the road race there in Australia. How sad could he be, right? And then and then actually O'Brien Kirkland, uh, Keelan Keelan O'Brien was one from Jake Olu the sprint finish among four guys springing it out for for third place too. So it was right. all because he Jake. wasn't chasing at all. No, I'm sure he was sitting on. Yeah, yeah. all Jake Olu the podium for that one. So yeah, uh, you know. It, but that, yeah, that's the way it's going to be. But it was, so normally, though, I mean, the last couple of years, it's been almost that way for Tour Down Under, not quite like that. Now, but now been, Luke, Luke Plopp, though, won both the last, time trial in the last oh, two years. Oh, he won the I know race. he's doubled up before, yeah. Third, I think this is his third road race in, the year, in a row. He did not win the time trial last year because he flatted yeah. and then dropped the fourth. And then... And, so he said he, he credited winning this year is because he also flatted in this one or had a mechanical and had switched right, bikes. Right. Yeah, we talked about that last yeah, week. Yeah. The, doing the yeah. work on. So actually, I talked about that this weekend. I was at the Endurance Exchange Conference um, in in uh, here in Charlotte, North yeah. Carolina. By and so a lot, a lot of talk about time trailing there because it was primarily triathletes. It was supposed to be geared a little towards USA Cycling as well, but they had no presence whatsoever. Um, there, so it was almost all time trialing for the cycling part, and so we talked about using power meters and 
going by perceived rate of exertion. And so I said, Luke Plop just won <laughs> the Australian national championship, and he had to switch bikes to a bike that didn't have a power meter and had to go by feel. And it was interesting because I talked to that about quite a few people, and nobody was aware of that, even though I would think triathletes would be aware of time trial national championships, but uh, they weren't. Yeah. <laughs> Not one That's, person. So <laughs> did they pretty equally divide between swimming, running, and cycling at this conference, or did one was, discipline get more attention, or did you just pay attention only to the cycling, since that's the only part that yeah, you were concerned? There was a lot of, of swimming stuff, a lot of swimming stuff. I didn't go to any of that. And then there was some running stuff, and Ever kept talking about how great the gait analysis session was, but I didn't go to that one either. So I went to mostly yeah, just all cycling things, if I could, and some sports psychology things and things like that, too, and some functional strength things. So I did things that were all related to cycling because that was hopefully my track. They didn't have a cycling track, though. They, you know, they had a coach's track, I think, and a promoter's track, a race director's um, track. But, yeah, it was kind of disappointing from the cycling standpoint because it, even though it was billed as being a cycling and USA triathlon collaboration, it was not at all. It was at least from wow. the way I perceived it. So maybe the organizers, I know maybe – Maybe a name and like, intent, perhaps somewhat, or but not in reality and practice. Yeah, no, no, no cool branding. And I only heard USA Cycling mentioned um, when John Tarkenton was on a panel, and he was from USA Cycling, the coaching director. Uh, so he mentioned USA Cycling then. And then uh, Chris Naven, a friend of mine, was giving a presentation on esports. And so he talked about USA Cycling's esport national championships a little bit. Which just happened time, last weekend, right? The same time? Was, what's going on, the, right. happening as as the conference? Well, yeah, he was. He gave his presentation on esport e racing uh, Sunday afternoon, and the race had happened that morning. So, yeah, he talked about it that weekend for sure. But, um, yeah, it was happening then. Yeah, and, and so that was yeah, – we could talk just for a second about that. You know, there's, there's national champions for that, um, relatively small fields for the – So, so, you know, so this esports, everyone's at home doing it? Participating, participating right participating. or their garage yes. or... right now but the world championships though are going to be in person in abu dhabi i think or something like that they're they're flying over a certain number of people to the middle east mm -hmm. and they're going to do world championships and they're not using zwift either they're using another platform which i forget the name of it right now who it's also a middle eastern backed um esports platform and they're paying uci a ton of money to hold the world championships on that platform for the next couple of years and GT is what USA Cycling is, is is used for years, and although they use Swift a little bit too, back and forth. But RGT got bought by Whoop. Whoop then disbanded yeah, RGT. Yeah, yeah. yeah, after saying they were going to make it into a real rival for Swift, um, that didn't happen. And so then, and my understanding too is there was something to do with the Swift branded trainers and the Whoop branded trainers, and there was some kind of agreement that they would drop RGT, and then Swift would use something of Whoops or something. I don't know. So there's a lot of back back room dealing with that kind of stuff so it was on Zwift though this year um and uh, it was the the age groups which is funny because again in triathlete it's not like pro elite amateur and then age group it's all pro or age group everything is age group there's no like cat three races or cat four races you know it's your age group and so they a, um age group races for the esports were all one day races one event races just an event one time and then the uh, elite races though was a time trial road race and a crit yeah. and so there's yeah. a fine thing yeah too so um yeah i mean the the uh what, what do you have uh, any idea what the participation number is like how many people are how how big the fields are yeah so the esport men's elite race uh shows there being 39 finishers with another six or seven people that that dnf'd so and based on other things too, those other people may or may not have might have been DNSs too, because I noticed some people got designated as a DNF who didn't start. So 39 people uh, raced. So um, yeah, and it was apparently it was it was fairly tight. The first guy, Brian Duffy. So he uh, won. I should look at the article again here real quick. He won the road race and the crit, I think. <clears throat> So do they uh, mail yeah. them? Do they mail them a USA Cycling National Championship jersey, and then you can only wear them when you're on your trainer? Is that it? Well, he so he won the road race, was second in the crit, yeah, and then but he, and he won the time trial, I think, too. Um, yeah. So the first year when I won my age group, the first year they had it, we didn't, we just got a virtual jersey. So on RGT, then you could race in a virtual national okay. championship jersey, 
And then last year I got third, I dropped my chain. So I was lucky to get third actually. Um, I chased for like 15 minutes. I, I got a third place medal mailed to me and the winners apparently got jerseys mailed to them. So I, I said, hey, what about last year? I won, I should get a jersey. But yeah, no retroactive on that one. Um, yeah, so they, this year I'm guessing they'll get jerseys again and medals, but you can only uh, wear it in races on virtually. But so, um, yeah, RGT actually had virtual jerseys you could wear, which was nice. That was kind of fun. I don't know if Swift's going to have to virtual national, national championship jerseys or not. Mm. Yeah, and that'd be interesting to see what that new platform is too. Again, I forget what it's, the name is. But in for the world championships, they'll have, I'm sure, some kind of virtual national team jerseys or something. But they'll be present, so they can award, have an award, and yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure. I guess, I guess they're gonna have a limited. Unless somebody piece. wins, that's not there. I mean. Well, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if they're gonna allow people that aren't there to race. So, I, because you do have to be careful about, um, you know weight doping and that kind of stuff too. So there's been a number of times when, when I've raced these races, you, I do the pro races or the national championships, I've had to, you know, film myself, video myself weighing in with verifying the date and then the accuracy of the scale and then accuracy of my weighing on it. And then also they have to verify the accuracy of your power meter too. And you have to have a double, um, to, you know, get the confirmation. So usually I'd have the Wahoo kicker that I have as well as my, my Garmin pedals. As my two power sources so they have to do they do as much as possible and still even some people cheated you know they've disqualified some people for for cheating so you have them there then they're all in the same identical trainer and and calibrated the same and and they can weigh them right there in the same scale and stuff too so it does take out some of the some of the variability in terms of the the sport but at the same time esports the reason why you have those is because you can't race in person or you can't race outside <laughs> and so if you, and then they're thinking about doing it for the Olympics too, because Jackie got flown to Singapore and she did the a try a, a test event for the Olympics there. So um, yeah, it's yeah, it's huge. And then there's there's purpose built e stadiums where you know like the one I think in I think it's Abu Dhabi it's going to be uh, yeah. is, is purpose built for thing. And then yeah yeah I mean I think we got we got approached one time by a company that was doing esport things and and they have these stadiums where the you know, see, I don't know, 20,000 people and they make a ton of money. These video gamers, not doing cycling, but just regular video gaming, are sitting on a stage doing this with these huge screens above them. And then there's 10,000 people in the stands, 20,000 people maybe watching them do this. And those when you gamers, say we, who, who do you mean we? We were invited. Oh, you and I as a podcast. We, one time we had someone say that they wanted us to interview them and they were doing uh, esports. This is a number of years ago. And so they sent us a video, and and I remember watching that video. And in the video, in the video they sent us, a guy won like ten grand for winning this race, and he was putting out more than six watts per kilogram in the race too. I mean, he was, and he's, a, he was a Belgian, and he could have easily had a contract, I think, on a on a team, and he was doing the watts of a pro world tour pro guy, but um, he never rode outside. He only rode, rode yeah. inside. Wow. Yeah. So, but they had the same thing. They had a, like a stadium and people in the stadium and they each of the riders got an appearance fee for just coming. And then they had uh, prizes that were, you know, in the five figures and stuff too. So it was, yeah, it was. Didn't that Athens Twilight or other races, they've had trainer type racing before for start grid positions or. Hmm. Uh, I think I do remember something about that. Yeah, there have been races too, like the Redlands Classic and the Tour de Michigan. I actually participated one time in these straight line sprints, street sprints, where you you know you have ten people going off at a time. And my friend Nate Erickson, I think he was one or was top three, I think maybe in the Redlands one. That was his claim to fame, is he got top three in the straight line sprints. And that you know was kind of like a pre-excitement building kind of event too. And Downers Row one time did a rollerblader against a bicyclist race, you know, for a couple of years in a row because they had rollerblading national championships as well as the crit national championships on this on this course. So I think, yeah, I have seen that they've had some kind of e-race beforehand too to kind of raise the level of excitement. And certainly you could use it for seating and especially something like Athens where traditionally it's a crash filled, um, you know, race that it, being at the front is pretty important to get ahead of all the people that are going to be going down, hopefully behind you. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think it's, even though it's evolving real quickly and change real quickly and, and there's not really any consensus on how we should do this or what platforms we should use. I think, you know, just it's huge. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people around the world ride inside on, on these trainers and, and a lot of races. I've seen, 
I haven't really read anything, articles like in depth or seen headlines about people ditching the Pelotons or what I read some about they're getting rid of all the Pelotons. Like there's some what's what's the negative thing about Pelotons now? Do you know? Hmm. I have actually I think I actually saw that Pelotons starting to have races even, which is not supposed to be. It's supposed to be a fitness platform and they made a ton of money during the pandemic. I think they might have done overproduced a little bit, so you could buy Pelotons really cheap after the pandemic got over because they made they were making so much money on the Pelotons, and they made too many. And then when the Pel when the pandemic ended, then they had a, a glut of of Pelotons. So for a while, you could buy them for really cheap prices. Hmm. Um, but I think it's still super popular, even though it's nowhere near as popular at the height during the pandemic. It's still really popular. And I thought I saw something about races on Peloton bikes too. So maybe they're introducing some. That way, that's about all I've heard, I think. Yeah, I, a lot of people have them. You know, it's a pretty okay. significant investment nice. to buy a piece of equipment, and then you have to have a subscription, I think, to be able to mm. to have these classes. But I know people are still doing it. All right. Well, I was just thinking about technology a little bit um, that I saw an ad or an article, something about now earphones, like ear pods that can do heart rate. and. Yeah, I just saw something else. in Velenu. Is that you? Maybe that's Velenu, yeah. I, yeah, but heart rate and something else I saw just today. Uh, heart rate and body temperature. Oh, body temperature. And that's something, too. Actually, I went to a, a presentation at the Endurance Exchange about body temperature. A guy just had this. It's, it was billed as thermal regulation, but I talked to him afterwards, and he said that they suggested he call it thermal regulation. He wanted to call it something else because he just bought one of these core body temperature um, monitors that you – it's a chest strap, but it has – somehow it measures your – your body core. I missed the beginning of the presentation, so I didn't see that part. But at your core temperature, and then your skin temperature. So he had, then he just did experiments on himself. He's apparently a, a coach that has hundreds of athletes, triathletes, and they. Um, so he just does experiments on himself, and then applies that to his athletes too. Like if I race in this temperature with this clothing, or do this and that too, then I get this kind of performance impacts and things like that too. So because core body temperature too is is important. If it gets too high. It's really hard to bring that down, so uh -huh. it's something important to, to measure. So I'm not sure. This is just I'm sure body temperature is probably I, I don't know if it's core or skin temperature, what it is. But that's another thing to monitor. So now they talked a lot about continuous lactate monitoring at the conference too. So we, we've had um, glucose monitoring. This the people right. not just in the arm. They put the arm there, but some some of the type uh, two diabetes type. Type one diabetics, type two diabetics, either ones, I guess. Type ones go primarily put them on their hips or other places of their body, but we see them a lot on the shoulders. But then there's also then lactate monitoring, continuous lactate monitoring, which is pretty revolutionary too, and can be used in training but not racing, just like the glucose ones. And then yeah, the core body temperature monitoring. If you start to get too high and in your team car behind you saying, hey, you know what, you got to back off here or else you're not going to be able to finish the race or something. They, they can't give you like a, a ice vest to put on the uh, put on your back to cool you down. Or I'm not sure what the what the use of ice vests. My friend Larry Nolan last year at Nationals was in Augusta, Georgia, and he had a camelback filled with ice to start that race. And then I was in the feed zone supporting one of my athletes. And when he came through, I think second to last lap, he dropped it off. He said, Randy, he, he threw me his ice vest because it melted at that point. So it wasn't really a vest, but it, was, it definitely kept him cool, he yeah, said. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he finished second. A guy, a, guy, a guy got away. Larry's, you know, like, geez, I don't know. He knows exactly. 60-time, 70-time, 80-time national champion and like a 40-time world champion or something like that, yeah. too. So, but people are using things like that. Yeah, I don't know what the – it is heavier for sure. But Augusta course is very flat, so it wasn't really a, an impediment that way. And it's trade-offs all the time, keeping yourself a little bit cooler or well hydrated versus the weight. You know, it doesn't matter how light and yeah. what your great power to weight ratio is if you if you overheat or bonk, you know, then that's not going to help you. So, and right. if you are super cool, but you, you weigh so much you can't go up a hill, then it, right. you know, it's like, all it's like, trade it's like the trade-off of aero position versus getting enough power from that aero position. Yeah, that's continuing to evolve all the time, too. Of course, again, it's the same thing. This conference, you know, Arrow is a lot for the triathletes. And so they talked about that again, about positioning and how what used to be, you know, a really good position 
so-called um, now it's changed because of the air pockets it creates and things like that too but then what you were just saying too the most aero position sacrifices watts a lot so usually you have to find that compromise between producing not the same watts you would produce in your normal position but not you know but getting the aero advantage to compensate for that and then finding the the happy medium between those where you're going Sweet the fast yeah even though you're producing less watts you're more aero what gets you there fastest I, then I saw something interesting with the track bike, I believe, that had a seat post that was, well, it, it wasn't just a seat post. It was like two posts, like a, they said it looked like a Dyson. Um, <laughs> that, I, I, yeah, it looked strange, but it, apparently it was more aerodynamic. Yeah, well, the, the Lotus bikes that the Brit Great Britain team has been riding the last couple of years, got these super wide forks and seat stays. They stick really far out. Looks really weird. Um, but Lotus says it's more, you know, Team GB says it's a more aero advantage. So, which is so funny because back in the day we still and, and they win a lot. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. We always put everything as close as possible. The, you know, the fork is as close to the tire as possible, and the back same thing. And, and now you know they're finding out that it's a little bit wider lets the air flow through better. And yeah. we used to ride as skinny as tires that we could too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny too because again, one of the sessions I was going to was talking about marginal gains and stuff too, and then they were saying though, you know what, that's such a small part of it, you know, that the, the training is the major gains, <laughs> you know. So yeah. we spent all the time thinking, well, these marginal gains are so important. It's so important to save, you know, another watt or two. Where if you just train and maybe watch your diet, you know. So if you're at the absolute elite level, if you're the absolute top level, you know, where things are being decided by just these fractions, and you're already training optimizing everything else too sure those marginal gains are huge but for the vast majority 99 percent of people yeah. who are riding bikes and stuff like that too you know if you just well, train yeah, yeah. And, and eat better you're, you're yeah gonna, the people that are trying to say you know spend more money and save a few grams here and there if they just you know would lose a little weight they would save a lot more weight than what they're spending yeah. money on but of course the bike industry needs them to spend the money to especially now the bike industry having the struggles yeah. it's having but yeah and it's sure. fun to have that stuff too and if you're gonna choose something anyway like you know if you're gonna buy a new bike you might as well buy the best you can buy for your pricey point yeah you know you should buy a crappy bike just because you knowing that you'll be able to make up for it but if you feel like you know i have to buy a new bike to get better you know you're riding a really good bike already then that's you know most times if you just train a little more you'd be you'd be better off too and then that's or a good thing better yeah as a coach you know. more yeah, I mean, sometimes it is just riding more for some people. Like if you're not riding at all and you want to get better in shape, if you just ride, period, you know. And so, and, and then as a coach, that's why I look at a lot of my athletes too, you know, where are they starting from? You know, so I have an athlete I'm just going to start working with again now, and they had a major injury, you know. So getting back in shape from this major injury is going to be much different than somebody who's honing their fitness for a national championship, <laughs> you know. So, um, you know, you have to look at where the person is, what their goals are, what you know things what resources you have and what time they have and all that kind of things too and you figure it out so sometimes you know someone that may not need a coach if they're if their goal is just to be able to ride 10 miles you know which is a lot for sometimes people and then then they should maybe just get out there and ride a little bit each time and i can certainly help but, them yeah I would certainly not, some some people though just need a little accountability and a little bit of more guidance and just yeah. someone to you know just push them a little bit where they might you know take days off or not do what they need to do because maybe they need that extra motivation yep yeah exactly if you're not very intrinsically motivated if you're externally motivated you know you need someone with you then having a coach even if they're not telling you a whole lot of stuff other than get on your bike and ride that yeah. can be a huge benefit you know? oh yeah where other people if you're intrinsically motivated you might need a, a coach to tell you hey you back it off a little bit you're riding too much which is certainly a Sorry. problem for some people yeah. too so yeah i'd say in most cases a coach is is going to be hugely beneficial um you know but it depends on your situation whether you feel like financially versus you know your rewards or whether it's worth it for you. All right, my son Taylor, he's been on a recent podcast, going to be on I guess Fast Fast Talk, Trevor's fast talk, podcast, yeah. yeah, coming up in a little while. Although Taylor said, oh, we're going to record it. I thought he said like I don't know later this month or a week or so, but it'll be in February come out. I was like, wow, month. we we record our podcast, get them out the same day. <laughs> Of course, we don't put that much, uh, um, maybe planning and editing and. Right. If we were trying together, to educate so. people about a specific topic, 
then it would be much more preparation and editing on our part and stuff too. But yeah, ours is more of a conversational kind of in, informing what's going on right this minute, right? Yeah, but if we were right, if we were trying to teach people things, sure. you know, in, in more in depth, and we teach people, I hope, you know, quite a bit of things, but it's 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 more just, you know, Brand, knowledge brand, here. randomly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Right. Well, but yeah. I, I was thinking though with Taylor, I, I was listening to the podcast and um, the interviewer would ask him some questions, and there always were there was no straight answer because there's so many variables in yeah. each individual on on how, you know what's going to be beneficial and you know what you have to take into account too. So that's another thing too. Like if you think, oh, I'll just go online and follow a plan. I mean, there's so many other variables that go in that. One plan is not going to fit everyone, yeah. for sure. Oh, but. Yeah, but that's the thing too is that, you know, again, if you, where you know, what your goals are, you know, where you're starting from, what your goals are, and stuff too. And so, an online cookie cutter plan is going to help a lot of people, you know. Sure. But if you really want to optimize, you follow it. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to optimize your performance too, then having something tailored to you is far superior, you know. So if you have, you know. A lot of time or don't really care about what your performance is you just want to get better than you are right now <laughs> then you know following the online plan can certainly help you get there but if you want to really be the best you can be then it helps to consider those variables you know and, and you could do that somewhat so by your by yourself you know getting online plans that are maybe tailored if you can put in you know tons of parameters that help narrow that down to have a focus that's more with what you want specifically but yeah hiring a coach is yeah. certainly good well, well that's kind of funny because um Taylor, of course, the cycling coach, you cycling coach, but I like to run you know, a few times a month and I can still run pretty fast. And I have a goal to stay under, a, do a sub 20 minute 5K each year, trying to make it to 60 maybe and still do it. I, I don't know. I got a couple more years, but I hadn't achieved it until like later in this fall. And I was getting close, but I didn't really train for it. But I was talking to Taylor about it and he gave me a suggestion on pacing and that. And I, I tried it and I don't really, I'm not looking at a computer, like my wrist. It's like, you got to like raise your arm and really visually look and, and pay attention. I don't like to do that so much. It's not like on a bike computer that's right in front of you. You can be staring at it for quite a bit. So, so I'm trying to, you know, do it in my head. And, and amazingly, I was able to pretty much spot on the pacing that he suggested. And then, and I achieved what I wanted. You know, I got the sub 20 minute 5k like that. Oh, just one, just a small amount of attention from, from from a coach like that and a suggestion, it was beneficial in, in you know in a small way, but still makes you think. Yeah, coaching can produce a, a lot of um, positive results. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. And there's a lot of talk about that too, about AI helping with coaching and stuff too. And uh, AI, it, yeah, yeah. But mostly they're saying that AI is a tool that coaches can use to be a better coach, but it's not really a substitute for coaching. Yeah, I just saw a ad from Photoshop from Adobe su suggesting to pay for a service that AI would help you with the Photoshop, and I'm just wow. Well, I see <laughs> when you think about AI, I see warning signs in the airport in Atlanta about potential dangers of AI, and just it's something that's kind of sneaking up in a way that I guess it's, it, I mean, it's in so much of our daily lives that we don't even know. I think a lot of it. Um, yeah yeah and actually too like in my just my my phone when i take a picture you know i oftentimes they'll say lighten the picture you know adjust the lighting that's ai or yeah. now it's like hdr enhance or something like that too i'm not sure what that is but you know that's ai too so you know it it has you know you, you see it, it's in our daily life constantly i think we just don't always understand that it's it's ai right um, but we assure you there's no ai in this podcast other than maybe what we're reading on online but as far as what we're talking about it's yeah. um, no mm. artificial intelligence whatsoever it's suspect suspect intelligence yeah it's also it's some form open. sure yeah. well um yeah the cycle across we just touched i just mentioned it about mateo vanderpool just really riding away from this competition when he wants to because i think the last race the uh, uh sound what was it Zandhoven? Sand race. He's good in sand. He's good in mud. He's pretty much good in every surface. But he, he um, held back a little bit for about 
four laps before he decided to put the pressure on on the uphill section and rode away from everyone. So he only, he only won by twenty seconds. So and then it, well, yeah, because once he got a lead, then he backed off towards the end yeah. too. So yeah, Joris, Joris Newhouse was uh, second, and then Lawrence Sveck was a uh, third. So All right, yeah, and Isabert was only sixth that race, but I don't think he likes to stand that much. But. No, but he's maintaining barely now his uh, World Cup standing lead. I think Pim Rohar is, is catching, or he's already new in house. I'm not you know, sure. Right? One of them has got within like 25 points. So, but um, yeah. I saw that Matteo Vanderpool, I, I guess I read he was going to go to a training camp after that race in Spain for a little bit. Oh, right. Yeah. For team. And so, team, right. Team. Yeah, so yeah. maybe that's why we saw the announcement on the pro cycling stats that he's taken off several races in the spring. Maybe they did some evaluation and what his goals are. I don't know. Maybe usually they set their their calendar more in December, don't they? I don't know. But he uh, he's got yeah. Milan San Remo taken off his plan, Turner Adriatico, get Velvim. So several races have been deducted, and I think also. I was reading about how Wout Van Aert was tearing up the cyclocross pretty strongly last year at one point, and then he ended up having a pretty poor overall compared to, you know, relatively compared to his other season, not, not as good as 2019. And so this year he's really scaled back and he's really focusing more on getting that elusive uh, Cobble Classic win. So it'll be interesting to see how their seasons play out, but. Not too available, man. If this if this is him not at full strength, yeah, yeah he's, he said, he's gonna he's gonna have another banner year probably. Yeah, well, and they say he's hoping to. It, it's, it's interesting because he was much more. I think Wallet tried to be um, more consistent through the whole year and didn't quite have the highest peaks, but didn't have as low as lows either. Where Mateo Vanderpool had some super highs, winning world championship and stuff, but also had some lower lows too. So he he wasn't you know he was he was much more peaking specifically where Walt was trying to be in shape all the time. And so it paid off with some bigger wins for sure for Mateo. Uh, yeah. 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 World Championship Cyclocross, Milan San Remo, Perry Roubaix wins, World Championship Road Race wins. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. We're, you know, I mean, Walt didn't have a bad year by any he starts no. managing, but no. still it wasn't, you know, yeah, wasn't, wasn't as. No big marquee wins like that. Yeah. He thought he could have been better. So. Sure. But, you know, for, 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 yeah, so we'll see. I mean, it, it's, you know, they're, they're different people, too. You can't say the same training program is going to work for both people, too. Some people are just better than others in terms of being the same, you know, Tade Pikachu, right? He he is winning all year long. And this year, like you said, he's going to back off some of them on the races he's doing. But he's not going to back off and try to win the races he's doing. Right. So he might win fewer races because he's not targeting as many or not racing, period, as many. But um, he's still going to try and win all the ones he's in. And he does a really good job of that, too, where it's really rare for most people to be able to to do that well, um, you know, so consistently, for sure. I mean, just to do well in general. These, these guys are – they're, they're already – I mean, look, anybody in the world tour is an unbelievable cyclist. Is anybody. Wow. The, the last guy in the roster, all those are unbelievable yeah. cyclists. Fantastic, and then, yeah. And then you get the guys who are the, the, the point earners of those teams. You know, they're earning the points for the UCI um, teams, and that's, that's, you know, the top 10 guys or so. They're getting – they're so even better yet. And then you get the, 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 the these team leader, unbelievable guys like, you know, Walter, Teo Van these, these are generational writers, too. I mean, yeah, they're, you know, but there's so many of them, too. Like, I, I saw an article this other day about whether Egan Bernal was going to maybe yeah. ever, ever come back and win the, the Tour de France. When he won the first one, he was so young, third youngest winner ever, right? So he um seemed like he was going to win forever. And then he had this horrific crash running in the back of the bus. And then, uh, you don't know if he's going to come back or not, but you know the, there are so many people. If you add him into the mix, if he does get, ever get back to it too, it's just a lot of people that are riding at a super high level right now too. They're yeah. you know like they call them people call them space aliens and everything else. I don't know if we mentioned it in the last podcast or we talked about it, thinking about Matteo um, Jorgensen having you know what kind of program will they have coming to this big team where. He won't have like as many leadership or chances, maybe a, a movie star where he could race all the races. But it looked like he has a very solid program. And then I I don't know if I mentioned about Brandon McNulty that he wasn't included in the pre-roster for the Giro or the Tour. Like, oh, what, what's going on with Brandon? But uh, it seems like they hear me over there at Velo News. <laughs> well, what I'm wondering, because then they come out with a nice article. Andrew Hood's good at that, like, of 
um, finding out what, what are these programs. Um, I mean, he's in Europe, so he can get to these training camps. And it sounds like Brandon McNulty has got a, a lot of strong backing from, from the team with high expectations of him to, to do really well in some of the races and looking at more one-week races now, but possibly like the Volta, I think we did mention, that he could possibly have a, some kind of leadership position there. But they they see his numbers still and, and his abilities, and they do have um, hopes for him to, to really excel and have have some big, probably some big wins coming up. So, I mean, he missed the Tour of Luxembourg, which is not a very you know big stage race, but it was just one second off winning the overall there. So, but um, yeah. to win any races in Europe is a big deal. And, and yeah, so so that was positive just to see a little reinforcement that at UAE with that, their super talented high roster that Brandon McNulty is not going to be totally lost in the mix of all those top riders and still have some chances for an American to do well. Yeah, and I know Joe Domrowski was still looking for a contract, and I saw that one of the world teams, tour teams, was still was was so it, they have a minimum of I think 27 riders, and then a maximum of 30 or something like that. And there was a team that had 27, and they're looking for a 28th person. <laughs> hey, Joe. Joe. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's interesting that some a few teams, and not every team has 30. I guess that's a few of 27, 28, 29, but most of them I think 28 or 29 riders. So it's not like they're all at the max all the time. So there wow. still could be no, and then somebody from Jumbo. Oh, it was Jumbo. I think it was maybe Jumbo because they it had a guy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I keep saying that. Sorry. <laughs> yep. So Visma, Visma um, had a uh, had someone retire, or like just in late December. They didn't. They I think they thought they were going to keep in contract, and so they I think they might be one rider shorter than what they are supposed to be right now, or wanted to be right now. So uh, yeah, you uh, like. I the most. Taking pay up, attention to the time, like keep us around an hour ish. And I don't know, the clock show on 105. Did we really talk that long? I didn't think we were talking about so much that it went on that long, but yeah, um, yeah. we're going to wrap this up. 41, no, we're at 41 minutes. Oh, 41. And oh maybe yep. we've been, the phone call has been, or maybe I started recording before I thought. Yep. No. <laughs> no, there were, okay, yeah, record. that's a, that feels more like 41 minutes. I was like, how could we be an hour already? Yeah. So, because we don't want to leave out our birthday, I, I took a sneak peek at the birthday list, and so th that's um that's good. But we're looking forward to like the, the women's tour down under starting on the twelfth, just a couple of days from now, and then the men's on uh, the sixteenth. Oh, I I wanted to mention because I saw the article about Quinn Simmons, the U.S. national champion, right. road race champion, and how the Gina Mater crash really affected him last year. That yeah. he almost um, was thinking about not you know racing anymore. And I saw him at the um, USA pro criterium national championships where his his brother was racing he you know he just did the road race quinn did but he did seem a little subdued to me then because i talked to him after like the first tour he did and, and he's a pretty energetic positive like affable person to talk to but when i saw him he, he just didn't seem himself to me but i haven't been around that much to know but i thought huh it's not the Quint Simmons I had talked to before, so maybe that was probably very present still in his mind about thinking about racing. And and I guess he's had a little bit of a struggle to get back to where descending isn't affecting him so much. Like he he can descend now again the way he used to, without being um I don't know if I say worried or concerned or just scared how fast they descend in a race is where he, he's doing it now by himself, but he's not sure in the in a race, like with how the race is around, how he'll feel. So, but there won't be any of those descents in the tour down under. No, 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 no. And he also, yeah, was saying that he comparing himself with some of the other guys. So he won the junior world championship road race, you know, in, in the uh, Burgess right. guard or. No, he won in Yorkshire. Yorkshire, Yorkshire. So, uh, and then other people though have won at the same age when that you know like the Evan Pohl and Pagacha and you know, winning the you know races at 19 years old and stuff too over two and then and then have gone on to win much more than he has and he said it's hard for him he's only won I think four races as a pro but he's won four races as a pro even even that yeah. right but he's so, had he's had some injuries and some sicknesses and just hadn't been able to put together a really complete full season of of full racing yeah and so in in in, in he's comparing himself against guys who are you know, like you said, generational riders too. So it's hard for him to to say, step take a step back and say, you know, that maybe he shouldn't be necessarily judging himself against that standard. Because there's been lots of if you went through and saw who was the junior world champion over the years, 
you'll see that many of them have gone on to achieve great success and many of them you never hear about again too so sure. Um, and even the U23 world champion is not always, you know, the, the success isn't guaranteed because you win at one level and you're going to win at a higher level too. So, um, yeah, it's probably hard not to compare. You know, I mean, the same thing when I race, I don't just compare myself against the average American. You know, it's got to be the, the best of the best of my age group now. <laughs> you know, if I'm not the best of the best, then I feel like I'm losing. So it's 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 hard to put things into a context that other people might put put it into but yeah I, I we hope that he does well and toured on under and as we, you know it was great last year when he went to the tour wearing the usa uniform apparently he had a concussion uh you know yeah. and he raced a couple of days after having a concussion which he should have done and then they pulled him eventually but that was real hard because he was the first our first rider since i said who was it they said that was in the usa oh george incapi since george incapi like 15, 16 17 years ago who was racing in the national team jersey in the Tour de France? So, sure. Yeah. Well, the the motivation was to win the USA National Road Race from you know to honor Gino, and so and then that pushed him to want to go ride the tour, but you know wearing the national team jersey. But uh, yeah, I'm glad he's come back around to wanting to race his bike because he is an exciting racer and. And talented too so i hope he has a really good solid season this year and he actually you know the the spring classics is something he he could do very well in so hopefully but his team legal track i was thinking about that the other day how which teams maybe have really improved maybe i was the rosters and that and and uh -huh. i think legal tracks one of those teams with the additions they made um could oh you know, yeah and yeah, like Gigahard and Tendra yeah. Clerk supporting them and, and just and continue Mads, Mads Peterson's ascent. And yeah, it'd be interesting to see how well they do this year. Yeah, and really, I mean, he was saying too, based on the Olympic course this year, which should be relatively flat, you know, with a few bumps and stuff into it. He's kind of the guy who might be one of the favorites to be on there too. And so thanks to uh, Isap Kuz's, um when in the Volta, we got that third spot in the Olympics. So we'll have three riders and, and there's people like Jorgensen himself, you know, that are those punchers and stuff like that too, that might be in the mix to maybe win an Olympic gold medal. This could be a course that the favors riders like Quinn Simmons. And so if he can get himself into the right spot mentally and physically, you know, first he has to get chosen. This can be a little right. tough time sure. getting chosen, but then uh, USA oftentimes we don't have a real contender at world championships, but this year is a chance we might. World champions at the Olympics. Oh, at the Olympics. 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 Yeah. Although um, Brandon McNulty came very close to fighting out for the gold medal in yeah. Tokyo. That was tough to see. Yeah, he was, yeah. They are right yeah. to, I forget how many K it was, but it was. Yeah, he close put it to a phenomenal race, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was exciting for American fans to see somebody almost be there in the to fight it out but yeah right. yeah, yeah. No, yeah. But hopefully it's better yet. and i'll be there this year too maybe you will too but i'll be there for sure to see the the finish of the of the race and then uh yeah it'd be great to see what well, i was just i was just thinking actually when i was reading that article i was thinking wow it'd be so great to be there and watch um watch him win so i was at the olympics in 96 when armstrong was there and everybody thought well armstrong might win that race you know and obviously he didn't but it was exciting to be there and have someone in the mix so yeah maybe, we were there yeah. together at, at the 96 oh, for the for that road race we were yeah 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 great yeah with yeah. um frank andrea getting fourth yeah yeah and it's funny because everybody's like who's that <laughs> everybody thought it was armstrong all the regular fans because it's the only name they knew <laughs> but um yeah yeah i have one of my favorite pictures too which i showed frankie at one point too of of uh roy nickman spraying frankie as he's coming up in the through the feed zone too so uh, Cool. That's a good picture. So yeah, no. So I, hopefully, yeah, it, it, it'd be great. The, that Olympic course definitely could favor some of our current crop of racers who are doing well. So, all right. Now, I'm hoping Magnus Sheffield has a good solid year this year. He's still a strong, yeah, he was strong rider. And Ineos, um, I guess they're all right. Radcliffe and and Dale Brailsford are more focused now in Manchester United. So as much going into the, the cycling team but um didn't they sign aj august too i think so yeah yeah because yeah, so. yeah, yeah. yeah, he was saying that with magnus sheffield on that team he was somebody that could really help him make the most out of that experience so yeah yeah 
right. Yeah, no, I think people don't want to dis- they, they sometimes discount Ineos because they aren't winning Grand Tours like they used to, but they're and they are losing some riders for sure. Yeah. But they still have you know super strong super strong team and great riders. So yeah, and so I, I saw that Garrett Thomas was not sure what he's gonna do. That he's, he's doesn't look like he's gonna do the tour this year, and they're wondering if he's gonna do the Giro again. I guess he won't commit right now whether he's doing the Giro or not. Yeah, now if Teddy Pagatz is gonna do it, I, I wonder how what other people think what their chances will be. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, but but it's not like Pickaxe gonna be all in for the GC this year at, at the, the tour. Yeah, so right. that's interesting to see. But I think that that's the case too. It makes they have a lot of good support riders. So Garrett certainly has the experience of being a Grand Tour, you know, Tour de France winner. So uh, he's invaluable in some ways being on the team. But then at the same time, if he could be a leader at one of the other races too, you know, it's hard. Even on a team like Ineos, like I said, where they don't have an, an obvious you know person that you put right now in the top three in terms of your predictions, they have guys yeah. in the top ten and and sort of assemble. To maximize that position, it's it's tough to see who's gonna be on that team and stuff. Yeah. So six months out, but like you said, also too, a lot of teams put their calendars together in December or early January at latest and say who's gonna be racing where. I mean, you have to have it now for the who's going to tour down under, right? Just to start those racing. I was thinking that now that I this year I've been a little bit later. I started my lifting program. I'm in my twelfth week right now of lifting, so I started that at a good time. But I haven't been riding hardly at all. I've been doing any indoor riding because of. Um, situation I can't do indoor riding right now and um so I just really started riding harder outside now <laughs> last week or so and oh it's hard you know it's like it's, it, everything hurts you can slower up everything and it's just it's hard to do and uh you know and my weight went up a couple pounds over the holidays not much you know four pounds five pounds but more than I you know so I'm starting to watch that a little bit more now and so I'm just starting to think about those things now but these guys in Tour Down Under, or even you know someone like Taylor, who's going to be racing not till probably seriously till March or whatever, but still, yeah, he's going to do the 12-hour Santos mountain bike race in February 17th. So yeah, but that's won't be one of the season goals for sure. Yeah, no. but but you know they've already been putting in big miles, and Taylor's been putting in huge miles. Not so sure, much so that yeah. I, I saw Robin Carpenter comment recently saying, you know, hey, what are you training for, dude? <laughs> so um, you know, but yeah, you, so many of these riders, though, you know, on the pro level, for certainly and internationally and even domestically, have been training already really hard for a month, month and a half. And so yeah, it's even though it's we've had a cold spell here in Asheville, we normally we have some 60 degree days sprinkled in and you know, and have one for a little while, and none's forecasted for a little while. So. Today I'll be going out and it'll be I think low 40s with the high maybe I'll scrape into that but then I'm gonna climb a little bit of elevation it'll be in the mid 30s. It's hard to train when it's like that but yeah. same time you know if you want to be good later on you have to do it. Sure. All right. So well, two down under right? <laughs> it's, it's crazy how much they've already had to you know and some of them won't be in shape that's the thing too at the tour yeah. down under but, mo- but a lot of them will be and it'll the be. Jake Lilla riders probably are gonna be pretty good. Yeah, I know, and they and the and so they were saying Luke Plop and and then Yates, uh, Simon Yates is are the, the two uh, favorites right now, and they're both on Jake Olu. <laughs> so I would hope it's not a, a, a Jake Olu, you know, dominating the race. I hope it's you know they have some people that are be doing other things. I, I, so I haven't read Richie Port's stage by stage analysis, but I want to look at that a little bit because you'd hope that it'd be an exciting race overall, not just one team kind of controlling it. That's not really that much fun, and usually the race is decided by something. Specific, like well, I'm the hill that that um, Richie Port, yeah, seven times, right? So and one one year he won it and didn't win the overall. His teammate won the overall, but he, six times I think he won it and won the overall. So basically, the race came down to that hill every single year. If you won that hill, then you're gonna win. And Richie Port was doing it, so that's that's not so exciting. Um, but hopefully there'll be lots of other stories and good racing and and other teams animating things. So it's it'd be a fun yeah. race to watch. Although I don't have a watching option right now still, so I'm not sure how. If I'll be able to see any of it. Do you? Yeah. Have you done anything to watch races yet? No, nah, I haven't. Vinny and Gourmet is going to be there. That'd be fun. Yeah. Hopefully he gets, you know, win some, be in there in the sprints at least to see how that works out. So. Yeah, Filippo Ghana, not not tons of big names. So. No, no, we have Al, for, Al Philippe to be there, right? So yeah, like, he's one of the bigger ones. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, Jack Haig, you know, so. Uh, there's people that are, have motivation from and maybe have been down there too who are from New Zealand or from uh, Australia. New Zealand actually just had some races too. They, oh they, yeah, I saw um, Brendan Rim was sixth in the race. Oh, really? I think that was today. Yeah. In the, the uh, New a Zealand one day race. 
in the yeah New Zealand Cycling Classic, Aaron Gate. Yeah. Brendan Rim, look at that. Brendan Rim was six American, yeah, racing for the United States team. So, not many people. There's a couple of Japanese, Dutch, yeah, Dutch. I saw, yeah. And then, yeah, well, the last three spots were Americans. Gavin, yeah, well, I shouldn't have said their names, but they're from. Yeah, so they're, but they're not many Americans in there either too. So um, Thomas yeah, Gibbs. Well, they must have done a big poll to get Brendan Rim in position. Yes. But, yeah, well, yeah, sure. there was basically, yeah, everyone finished together pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, within a minute, all the way down to 80th place, so then the last tailing in riders, you know, and the Americans came in at two b minutes back, so they just tailed off earlier, so. Yep, yeah, and Red Room, he's yeah. going to race for Project yeah. Edge again, but getting an opportunity to race for a national team there. So under that's good though. I mean, we need more opportunities. We were talking pre podcast about state of USA cycling, and so um, so it's good to see that they're offering riders opportunities. And other people yeah. are too. So I was talking to my friend Sean Wilson, and they they're sending teams over to Ireland and do the Junior Tour of Ireland and Junior Tour of Belgium or something like that too, and stuff too. So yeah, there's not it's not always just up to the USA cycling, but USA cycling oftentimes is the one who can facilitate these kinds of programs so it's good to have the opportunity so you know for like again brendan room to race at this level and to have a, a good you know well of course not this level here but if you can race at other races this this will help them get to these other races too so do they have they don't have a usc team they can't right in the in the santos tour down under so just the australian national team all the yeah other. right the host only the host country yeah. team yeah yeah. But they'll probably, my guess is though they're not, they're not going down just to do this one day race in New Zealand. Maybe probably, the Cradle Evans Great Ocean Race. How about that one? Uh, yeah. Possibly. I think there's, yeah. There's probably like other races. At, at his, Brendan Rim's schedule only shows the race he did today. So it doesn't show. Oh, this is more here. Maybe it's more. Ah, yeah. No, that's it. So. All right. All right. Well, let's get the birthdays in, wrap this up uh we always like it when we can pull a little bit of history with the birthdays and today for sure top frenchman one of the icons of the sport from you know a tour de france winner two-time tour de france winner yeah bernard tevenet so yeah he won nine stages um on the volta catalonia and romandy before five stages at the criterium de dauphine so uh, 76 years old. Racing yeah, Moses' career with for Peugeot. Yeah, that's famous team. Yeah, for sure. And Peugeot, the Peugeot team in the various iterations, but oftentimes with Michelin too. So with BP or SO, or my, my guess is by BP might own SO, and it might have even even been the same sponsors there for a long time. But yeah, he was he was you know an all around rider who excelled yeah. in state races, but. Yeah, he's got over 12,600 PCS career points. That's the pro cycling stats points. I don't know how, they, I mean, they're a little different than UCI points. I'm not sure how they figure their points, but his points, uh, career points are more than 10,000, more than the second uh, mm -hmm. rider on the list, which was uh, Daniela Caroli, who won the Milano Torino race back in 1985. A stage at yeah. Torino, Adriatico, and the Volta Catalonia was a stage winner, too. 65 year old um from italy yeah L L lucas postelberger is the uh, current race on the list yeah yeah and there too so goes quite the age 76 uh, 65 and then 32 year old yeah and then hayden ralston is fourth the australian who raced uh, i saw further down the list is craig lewis the american 39 and hayden and craig raced together on hcc high road back in 2011. <laughs> all right all right. Yeah. Yeah. Craig Lewis. Uh, yeah. I mean, he raced for TAA Craft back on the beginnings of the Slipstream program. You know, right. so, so he was on that and then took him Team Columbia, HTC and, and then HTC High Road. So he was he was there quite a bit. So and then the very end of his career is with Champion Systems Pro Cycling Team, which was a, a team that would go to Joe Martin and do all that kind of stuff, too, and, and do really well. And Tour of California, they think they raced in, too. So he, yeah. he's got to do quite a few quite a few races. He won a stage of the Tour de Bois, 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 I think. Bois, yeah. So, yeah. yeah Miguel Bryan is celebrating his 29th birthday. Miguel um, raced uh, at the same time Taylor was racing, a couple of years younger. Miguel's great sprinter raced for the Hink Happy team. 
and he raced um, in the tour of California, the Amgen Tour of California, and got fifth in a stage, just one place behind Peter Sagan and one place ahead of Alexander Kristoff. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's one of those, my guess is that was a, a position sprint, right? Yeah. I don't, and so, I mean, I, I've done well in a couple of sprints before where I just happened to be in the right spot and, and the whole pack's going fast, but you worked your way in the right position. And so it didn't come down to a pure sprinting ability. It was more like, you know, the race, the field was going super fast and you're on the right wheel and, and you're holding it in there too. And so that shows tactical savviness too, because Miguel Byron had to, Brian had to, Brian had to finish, you know, sprint against Christoph and Sagan flat out in those street sprints, you know. Uh, well, he, yeah, he was a fast sprinter too. Yeah. Fernando yeah. Gaviria won that stage ahead of Max Walsh, Caleb Ewan, Peter Sagan, Miguel, Alexander Kristoff. Wow. <laughs> so, that, that, yeah. High power sprint. And the, that back of Tour California days when they wanted to come in, in the, to warm weather in the early season. So, right. you know, it, it didn't have to go to Australia. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Marcel Kittle is back there at 17th. Um, he probably shot. started at 85th and <laughs> sprinted at 17th. <laughs> so. Yeah. Adam Yates was there too that year. All right. I miss those days. Yeah, Amgen Kelp. That's too bad. That's not around anymore. Isaiah Adams, he's on the list too in the USA. All right. Happy birthday, Isaiah. 57 years old. Very nice. All right, Randy. Um, yeah, sometimes I think there's not much going on in the cycling world, but we're able to um, find plenty to talk about. We didn't mention this. I'll just say real quick. There, in, um, there was something about... Uh, Quick step, I want to say there's the team right now. Is it, is it quick step? What is there? Is her name? There? No. Quick Sudal quick step. Sorry, Sudal quick Sudal step. Quick step yeah. yeah, so they're still riding. So I, I was talking about my tough year to some people I hadn't seen for a while at the conference and and said that I flatted it in one of the time segments at, at the um Grand Fondo Nationals and so I, I couldn't win, but um, quick Sudal quick step still using it's just you saying I should use so uh. I should use tubeless. Right. You know, and she was very surprised and it was hard for me to convince her that it'd be better to ride tubes sometimes. But Sudal, quick step, still riding tubes. Okay. And I think I think Bora is too, still riding, riding tubes uh, in races. So Bora rides tubeless in training, <laughs> but tubes in racing. So is that um, a sponsorship kind of thing though? No, the sponsor is specialized, both teams, and, oh. and specialized says it's better to ride tubeless. <laughs> so it's a definitely a team thing, and 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 Sudal Quickstep says they're moving towards tubeless at some point, but they're just not there yet. So, um, yeah, right. So they ride cotton tires with uh, latex inner tubes. Um, yeah. All right. So we'll keep, try to keep track of the number of flats they get this year. Yeah. Well, and they said, and they said too, and I, this is why I was telling the person who was, I was talking to is that it depends on the kind of flat, you know. So if you have a a, a, a blowout. A tubeless comes off the rim and then you're you're out you know and if you have a if you have a, a certainly a sew up it'll stay on and you can control that very well and even ride on it for a while mm. if it's a puncture a small very small tiny puncture yeah. you know then for sure tubeless is better because it seals oh, right in. yeah yeah so it depends it depends and then if you have to you know swap things so it is a is a for me too the big thing is to having to swap your tires out so i put instead of having race wheels because i only have one set of wheels for my road race bike now I swap tires out for races, and if I had to swap tires out, you know, for all times of race, that'd to be set up the two. Yeah. yeah. Then you'd have to basically buy two sets of wheels. You have to have a training right. set. And a, yeah. 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 Anyway, so you see more stuff we didn't even talk about. <laughs> sure. All right, Randy. Well, it's good to talk to you. Catch up, and I do have another vacation coming up later this month. I know I was really? on vacation a lot. Yeah, I'm not going to be gone many times this year, I don't think. But yeah, we're going to Portugal. Um, I don't know when the well, dog, oh, we're not going to be in the Algarve area where the that race starts, but that comes later, I think, in February anyway. So, but anyway, yeah. Um, hopefully, we'll catch up again pretty soon. We can talk about what's going on at the Tour Down Under, Santos Tour Down Under. Santos Tour Down Under. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Randy. Bye now. Thanks. You.